early stage and locally advanced cervical cancers is often a cu cured by surgery and chemo radiotherapy. Still, unfortunately, metastatic and persistent or recurrent disease after platinum-based chemo radiation therapy remains a major challenge with limited treatment options available. Tate, how, how do you treat a woman with progressive disease after she's received platinum-based chemo radiation therapy? Okay, we're go I'm going to assume that uh, this is a disease that uh, is now widespread uh, or recurrent within the radiated field in the pelvis, which would be the case in mo most instances. Uh, the GOG studies actually uh, answer those qu th this question uh, for us uh, uh, to a certain extent. Um, Taxol cisplatin as a doublet is superior to other platinum-based doublets and is at least uh, as good, if not slightly better than a non-platinum doublet, the one non-platinum doublet that's been tested, which was topotecan taxol. Uh, and we also have evidence now, as many of you are aware, that uh, adding bevacizumab to that uh, gives a survival advantage so that uh, the standard uh, treatment ought to be taxol, cisplatin, and bevacizumab with one caveat, the fact that the patients had prior platinum. Uh, whether uh, uh, one can uh, then, if, if the patient has had prior cisplatin for concurrent chemoradiation, which is the most likely scenario, uh, can we then substitute carboplatin for cisplatin and achieve roughly equivalent results? Uh, historically, cisplatin has been regarded as the better of the two platinum compounds. There was one abstract presented at ASCO two years ago. Uh, that suggested that in the setting of prior platinum therapy for chemo radi uh, for chemoradiation, uh, carboplatin is as good as cisplatin and can be substituted and thus reduce the overall toxicity of the treatment. So in, the, in, in this subset that we're talking about here, you can make an argument that taxol carboplatin bevacizumab might be a reasonable choice. But one of those two, either taxol cisplatin bev or taxol carboplatin bev, ought to be our standard of care based on current evidence. Any Additions. So, Mike, are there any other uh, chemotherapeutic agents available today? Well, you know, this, this, the, the most common clinical scenario for this would be progression after the regimen that um, Tate just described. And, and one needs to recognize that in that setting, um, those patients have um, a dismal prognosis um, and most uh, other agents are going to have a low response rate, but they do exist. Um, <coughs> I would actually argue fairly strongly that in this particular uh, group of patients that if the performance status is adequate that looking for an appropriate phase one or phase two trial would be a, an excellent choice uh, because we really do need to find new agents. Uh, but other single agents that uh, we would use um, as if they haven't seen topo as a single agent we would try that. Um, we even occasionally go back to treat with single agent BEV even though they may have had BEV before. We don't know that without a window, they, they'll do all right. A weekly Taxol we'll use in Taxanes. Um, that's um, generally our choices. Fair enough. So, mentioned bevacizumab. Uh, Warner, what, which patients would you give bevacizumab? Or I could even ask, which ones would you not give bevacizumab? <laughs> in this situation, in this setting. <laughs> You know, to kind of um, echo what Tate was saying earlier, I mean, this is under the assumption that these are patients are not, that are not radiotherapy or surgical candidates. You know, I, I think it's exciting because we now have a drug that's FDA approved for metastatic recurrent cervical cancer. And, um, you know, so really the, largely all our patients who have a newly diagnosed recurrence or are not a candidate for other modes of therapy are now candidates with bevacizumab. And we would normally use it in conjunction with paclitaxel and carboplatin as we discussed earlier. Um, you know, we, there is a internal debate within our own group about, and you know, I'm sure we'll talk about this in a second, about the risk of fistula formation. And there are women who have recurrences that are at extraordinarily higher risk for that. And we may be a little more circumspect about how we use that drug. But, you know, to Mike's point, it, re re recurrent cervical cancer is a, it's a bad problem. And it has a really a poor prognosis. And so, you know, for us, you know, we have adopted this principle in terms of liberally using bevacizumab in this setting. So Bob, one question is sort of alluded to the unique, to potentially unique toxicities in this setting. You want to comment any further on that? Well, I think, um, you know, look, looking at the only randomized control data we have right now in this population, um, the three areas of concern in GOG240 were the fistula rate, GI and GU fistulas, occurred in about 6% of patients. So it's not a, a high number, and these patients are at 
greater risk, and I, it was, I think what, there was only one patient in the control group who developed the fistula during the course of the study, which is actually pretty remarkable. Um, there was also a difference in the rate of thrombosis, and I'm not sure if that was broken down. It was still under 10% in the experimental group uh, receiving bevacizumab versus the non-bevacizumab group. Um, and then hypertension, clinically relevant hypertension, occurred in about 25% uh, compared to only a few percent, maybe uh, some, something less than 5% in the control group. And generally, those were manageable um, uh, situations and, and did not escalate or cause a discontinuation of therapy. So I think one just has to have the, have the conversation with the patients, but still looking at the the shift in median progression-free survival to just over, from just over a year to a year and a half was pretty impressive, and I think it's a step in the right direction.